This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. World War II is not just a memory in the coastal mountains of Brazil. The date is April 22nd, 1978. The place is a small hotel outside Rio de Janeiro. A noisy party at the Hotel Till is broken up by police who discover the people are celebrating something odd. The 89th anniversary of the birthday of Adolf Hitler. The raid resulted in the capture of a wanted Nazi named Gustav Wagner. The capture was made possible by Simon Wiesenthal, who is known as the Hunter, for he has brought more than 1,100 Nazi criminals to justice. In Vienna today, World War II is not just history. Every corner of the city holds memories of the war, especially for those who cannot forget. Simon Wiesenthal cannot forget. It would be easy to say that what motivates Wiesenthal are his nightmare memories of the war. But many others have vivid memories of the Holocaust. Yet Wiesenthal is the only man who remains as a Nazi hunter. From the beginning, what drove Wiesenthal was his will to impose justice. And from the beginning, Wiesenthal's will for justice has been matched against Joseph Mengele's will to escape it. Joseph Mengele was a doctor of philosophy and medicine who performed horrifying experiments on humans and was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Simon Wiesenthal's training as an architect would have little bearing on his life's work as an international detective. Joseph Mengele allowed himself to be caught up in the Nazi tide. Simon Wiesenthal had no choice. Mengele's life as a Nazi criminal began at Auschwitz. Five million people died here. Every day, trainloads of men, women, and children arrived at this train siding. When people stepped off the train, the man they were most likely to see was Joseph Mengele. He was always immaculate in his sharply pressed uniform, and he was always unruffled as he decided each person's fate. If he would nod to the left, it meant hard work and starvation. If he would nod to the right, it meant a brief walk to what people believed were showers. Either way, the results were the same. Today, in a quiet corner of Vienna, there is a woman who remembers the totally unemotional character of the Angel of Death. Dr. Ella Lingens was a prisoner and physician at Auschwitz who was forced to work as an assistant to Joseph Mengele. Well, he was, you might say, especially bad because you felt that he was a cynic, that he didn't believe at all in the idea behind this extermination of Jews in the way the others did. Uh, as uh, somebody told that he had once said, uh, he didn't despise the Jews, he didn't think they were inferior, what all the others really believed. But he said, no, there are two gifted people in the world, the Germans and the Jews, and it's just a struggle for world domination, and uh, one of them will win. The Germans did not win, and Mengele saw it coming. He realized that the Russians would soon reach Auschwitz from the east. So he headed west, towards the Allies who were liberating Europe, and towards his home. While the entire continent was reeling from the shocks of war, Mengele actually had his Auschwitz chauffeur drive him home. Home was near Munich, in the Bavarian town of Gunzburg, where the Mengele family owned a large factory and was the largest employer in town. Even today, 
in search of crews encountered outright hostility when trying to film there. Mengele would remain in Gunsberg totally free for almost six years. Just after the war, Mengele went largely unnoticed in the crowd of Nazi criminals, and it was not until 1950 that his name came to prominence in connection with Auschwitz. Mengele then fled Gunsberg with the aid of Odessa, the secret SS organization that helped its members escape Germany. He went to Italy, making the border crossing at Ration Pass, near the northern Italian town of Murano. From Italy, Mengele sailed to Buenos Aires, Argentina. He arrived here sometime in 1952. Mengele found it easy to hide in Buenos Aires. Large German migrations in the last century created what are now substantial German colonies in South America. These colonies were natural havens for Nazis on the run at the end of the war. Mengele not only lived here on Sarmiento Street as a free man, but actually practiced medicine without a license in this house. He is reported to have met in this palace with Argentina's then president, Juan Domingo Perón. With this kind of protection, Mengele felt completely safe. But he could not know that his safety was only temporary. In Vienna, Mengele's movements had been carefully reconstructed at a place called the Center for Documentation. The patient years of tracking Mengele finally paid off for Simon Wiesenthal in 1957. I found Mengele in, uh, in Buenos Aires as a practicing doctor. I give the information to the uh, German, um, to the court in Freiburg and Breisgau and through Bonn and through the German ambassador in, uh, in Argentina, they ask for his tradition. Virtiz 968 was the address of the house where Wiesenthal found Mengele. It would take almost two years until 1959 before Argentina replied to Germany's request for Mengele's extradition. Argentina's answer came as a shock. The Procurador de la Nación um, give the answer the crimes of Mengele are political and not criminal. And I think this was the green light for Eichmann because if they don't extradite a man for, who was uh, in charge of field operations, to send hundreds of thousands of people to the gas chamber and they see in this crime a political crime, they would not extradite uh, Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann was kidnapped in Buenos Aires in 1960. His capture was the direct result of information supplied by Wiesenthal to Israeli agents. Eichmann's trial lasted nine months and as Wiesenthal had hoped, it reminded the entire world of the Holocaust. But Eichmann's capture also had another effect. Joseph Mengele vanished from Buenos Aires. At the very moment that Germany was trying to extradite Mengele from Argentina, he actually returned home to German soil for his father's funeral. He stood on this spot for the funeral service. Although he was widely known as a wanted man in Germany, no one in Gunsberg reported his presence to the authorities, even though he stayed here for six weeks. Later, Germany's public prosecutor would say that the people of Gunsberg had acted like a group of conspirators to help the Mengele family. Mengele helped himself after Eichmann's capture by going to Egypt, where there was a large German community. Unfortunately for Mengele, the Egyptian government did not want him. The Eichmann trial had created a strong anti-Nazi sentiment throughout the world. 
and the Egyptians did not want to antagonize the Americans or the Russians. Mengele's German comrades in Egypt chartered a yacht to take him to the remote Greek island of Kitnos. These photographs were taken by a reporter hired by Wiesenthal. The reporter was part of a group sent by Wiesenthal when he discovered Mengele was on the island. But it was too late. Mengele had sailed away two days before the group arrived. South America had kept him safe for most of the last 10 years, so he went to the heart of the continent. Joseph Mengele, now Jose Mengele, openly became a citizen of Paraguay in 1960. He could not have picked a safer place. A big number of Germans uh, emigrate after the war to Paraguay, after this war to Paraguay, and uh, they reorganized the police and today many of the children of the SS are today members of the police in Paraguay. And the small Jewish colony in Paraguay, they receive every week threats from the Germans. When something will happen against Mengele, they will kill them. And uh, I had here in my office a delegation of this uh, Jewish community from Paraguay and they asked me uh, to promise them to do nothing against Mengele in Paraguay because their life is in danger. And this is, and I believe them. Even so, Mengele did not feel entirely safe in Paraguay. During his first years here, he kept moving from place to place in the capital city of Asuncion. He is known to have stayed at the Hotel Colonial which is now a bank. His neighbors at the Hotel Astra would hear him in this corner room, screaming in the night. Number 508 on this street was probably his last residence in the city. Even though Mengele is never sure about his own safety, he is legally free in Paraguay. The fact is, however, he is wanted by several countries. One of these is the Federal Republic of Germany. Its ambassador to the United States, the Honorable Bernd von Staden. Josef Mengele is, continues to be a wanted man and will continue to be a wanted man until he is put on trial or until uh, he, he dies. It has been uh, our policy from the very beginning to uh, prosecute and to put to trial uh, these criminals ourselves uh, wherever we could and it is in line with this policy that whenever we find out that uh, a criminal is abroad in a third country and uh, uh, we have uh, a sufficient certainty of a crime committed to ask for extradition it is a policy consequently then to ask for extradition. But Paraguay's President Stroessner, who is himself of German descent, has always refused to give up Mengele. On Washington's embassy row, diplomacy calls for polite language, even in the most strained circumstances. The minister of the embassy of Israel, the Honorable Hanan Baron. The other. I certainly would very much hope indeed that if Joseph Mengele or any other Nazi criminal uh, would be discovered and caught in any country, that this country would find it in, in its own ways and means to bring the person to justice and if it cannot do so, to extradite him as quickly as possible uh, to either Israel or to a country in which he can be brought to justice. I cannot perceive and conceive of a responsible government in the world which would not want to have Nazi criminals brought to justice. The efforts to obtain Mengele's extradition proved to be fruitless. Nevertheless, Mengele's fear of capture drove him deeper into the heartland of Paraguay. His destination was the remote eastern part of the country, near the Piranha River. Very few outsiders are seen here, 
and those that come to look for Joseph Mengele do so at their own risk. Just before In Search Of arrived, two film crews, one British and one Belgian, had their film destroyed and were expelled from the country. In Search Of could only film using a camera hidden inside a car. Mangala spent a lot of time in the Piranha region on the estate of Alban Krug, a wealthy German industrialist who surrounded him with four bodyguards. But what protects Mengele more than anything else is his uncanny ability to avoid capture. This is the German-style resort town of Hohenau in central Paraguay. It was here in 1964 that Mengele came closest to being apprehended. A group of survivors of Auschwitz learned that Mengele was staying at the Hotel Tyrol. They came here and rushed up to his room, only to find it empty. Mengele had left just ten minutes earlier, after receiving a warning phone call. He was in such a hurry that he left in his pajamas. There are times when Mengele ventures outside Paraguay, but these times are rare because they involve a higher risk. One such occasion was in 1968, when Mengele went to Bermuda to meet some relatives. Wiesenthal learned about the trip and immediately sent a man to verify Mengele's identity. But once again, Mengele was already gone. The closer one gets to Mengele, the more elusive he seems to become. In Paraguay today, he is wrapped in legend. Wiesenthal must constantly guard against false rumors and mistaken identities. Wherever Mengele is in Paraguay, he has the protection of the Stroessner regime. There are times when even the remote Paraná region does not seem safe enough. Mengele then takes refuge in a large military zone in central Paraguay. It is a place so secure that even the Paraguayan police cannot enter it. In 1977, two events involving Mengele took place that are here reenacted for In Search Of. One of the last times Mengele was reliably spotted was when he was seen talking to two unidentified men on the Brazilian side of the Piranha River. Border checkpoints are few and far between here, and there is no record of his having made a border crossing. The most recent attempt to capture Mengele was made in that same year, when it was discovered that he was due to cross the border from Paraguay to Argentina at a given place and time. On that day, several agents were placed on the Argentine side of the border. Mengele's car was spotted, and the license plate noted some five miles from the crossing. But at the last minute, the car turned around and headed back into the Paraguayan interior. Today, Mengele's whereabouts can only be pinpointed by checking the most reliable sources in Paraguay itself. In search of made contact with members of Paraguay's opposition party who verified that this hardware store belongs to Joseph Mengele. Those same sources brought us to the small town of Altos. This road, which leads to a well-guarded gate which we were unable to photograph, is the access to a hacienda named Campo Condesa de Cue, where Mengele lives today. Thirty-three years is a long time, and the Holocaust seems far away. Now, there are two men who remain as living symbols of that moment in history. The hunted is 67. The hunter is 69. Look, if he will die before me, he will not die in peace, because he has no rest. He is going from place to place. And this is also a part of a sentence. And uh, you cannot uh, make a deal with the Lord that I must survive Mengele. My last wish will be, uh, in this case, to get Mengele. 
but nobody knows. I hope always there is no perfect crime, and even the, the biggest criminal and the best criminal make a mistake, and I am waiting for his mistakes. There was once a world in Europe that no longer exists, but it left behind an echo. The history of man is a history of crimes, and especially uh, the Jewish history is a history of full of repetitions. It's only the technology uh, is changing, but the hatred remains the same. We need Mengele before a trial as a witness of the history. The trial has a bigger importance than the sentence. Justice is a funny thing. No matter how man tries to impose himself, it follows its own course. Mm -hmm.